time to thank and praise God. Let us say the Christian family prayer together. Our Father in the heavens all around us, honoured be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive anyone who sins against us. Lead us not into temptation, but protect us from all evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. church family my name is Lilias and I'll be leading the English spot for this morning and the three words that we'll be looking at today are slogan mob and blind spot and the first word is slogan which is a noun a slogan is a short phrase that is easy to remember it's a short and memorable phrase that is used to advertise something for example a slogan can be used to advertise a product or a political idea. In advertising, businesses often have a slogan so that people will recognize a company and its products. Other words with a similar meaning include motto or catchphrase. Example one, 
After 60 years, KFC has decided to temporarily remove its famous finger-licking good slogan from its advertising. KFC management in the UK said that it stopped showing people licking their fingers after eating delicious KFC chicken because of concerns that licking your fingers could potentially spread COVID-19 among its customers. Example 2. In 2016, one of the most well-known slogans in the world was Donald Trump's Make America Great Again that he successfully used during the US presidential election. Over 1 million hats, each costing $25, were sold in the US. We're going to have a discussion. Which companies and slogans go together? So the companies are Sony, Pizza Hut, Apple, Schweppes, Lay's Chips and Audi. And we'll be matching those companies with the following slogans. Experts in mixing, engineering the truth, betcha you can't eat just one, make, believe, think different, we have a salad bar for some reason. You have two minutes to discuss those with the people around you at home, or if you like to, you can jump on the church WhatsApp group and share your answers there. Welcome back. Let's see if you managed to get all those ones right. So for Sony, Make Believe, Pizza Hut, we have a salad bar for some reason. Apple, Think Different, Schweppes, Experts in Mixing, Lay's Chips, Betcha You Can't Eat Just One, and finally Audi, Engineering the Truth. The second word is mob, which is a noun. A mob is a large crowd of people who want to make trouble. Often a mob is very noisy and they can even be violent. If you ever see a mob coming towards you, make sure you go the other way. Example 1. In 2014, a Ukrainian politician, Mr. Vitaly Zurovsky, was attacked by an angry mob who didn't like his policies. The mob grabbed Mr. Zurovsky, threw him into a large industrial garbage bin, hit him with a car tire, and finally threw rubbish on top of him. Example 2. Last week, angry construction workers clashed with police in the streets of Melbourne CBD. In one incident, a mob rushed at police who were then forced to retreat until riot police fired rubber bullets into the crowd. The protesters are unhappy that the state government is forcing all construction workers to get vaccinated. 
And the last word is blind spot, which is a noun. The word blind spot is used in two main ways. The first, a blind spot is an area that you are not able to see. While driving a car, it is very difficult to see another car that is slightly behind you and that is just to one side. This spot is called the blind spot. The second, a blind spot is also a subject or issue that you do not know anything about. You are ignorant about it. You are not aware of it. You don't think about it. When you are making an important decision, you never even consider it. Example one, Transport New South Wales says that motorbike riders can be hard to see in traffic and can be in a car driver's blind spot. And this is the reason why it's very important to check for bikes when you're on the road, pulling in and out of traffic, changing lanes, and even opening your car door when you're parked. Example two, Catholic Health Australia says that the federal government has a blind spot when dealing with aged Australians. Chief Executive Mr Pat Garcia says that the government concentrates on residential aged care facilities but too often overlooks home care workers. Mr Garcia estimates that 150,000 workers go into the community to provide care for 1 million vulnerable and elderly people in their homes. And the last discussion for this morning, do you have any blind spots? If you can't think of any, just ask someone in your family. Welcome back everyone. Hopefully you weren't blindsided by that discussion if you were asking someone at home what your blind spots were. So before we end the English spot, let's summarize the three words that we learned this morning and that will be helpful in the Bible talk. The first word being slogan, the second being mob, and the third being blind spot. Enjoy the talk today. A time to hear and think about God's word. Before we hear God's word, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for revealing yourself to us in the Bible. And thank you for inviting us to come into your kingdom by entrusting our lives to Jesus Christ. As you speak to us this morning, we ask that you will help us to listen with eager ears 
and to obey with joyful hearts. We pray this for your glory and for our good. Amen. Acts chapter 19 from verse 23. About that time, there was a major disturbance in the city of Ephesus concerning the way. It began with Demetrius, a silver smith who had a large business manufacturing silver shrines of the Greek goddess Artemis. He employed many craftsmen and he called them together, along with others employed in similar trades, and he pleaded with them. Gentlemen, you know that our wealth comes from this business. But, as you have seen and heard, this man, Paul, has been telling people that God's made with human hands and God's at all. And he's done this not only here in Ephesus, but throughout the entire province. Not only is he damaging our business, but I'm concerned that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will lose its influence, and that this magnificent goddess who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and all around the world will be robbed of her great honor. That set them off in a frenzy. They ran into the street yelling, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. They put the whole city in an uproar and they stampeded into the stadium, grabbing two of Paul's co workers on the way, Gaius and Aristarchus. Paul wanted to go in, too, but the believers wouldn't let him. Some of the officials of the province who were friends of Paul also sent a message to him, begging him not to risk his life by entering the amphitheater. Inside, the people were all shouting, some one thing and some another. Everything was in confusion. In fact, most of them didn't even know why they were there. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander forward and told him to explain the situation. He tried to speak, but when the crowd realized he was a Jew, they started shouting again, and they kept shouting for two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. At last, the town clerk was able to speak. He said, Citizens of Ephesus, everyone knows that Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis, whose image fell down to us from heaven. Since everyone knows this fact, you should stay calm and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, but they have stolen nothing from the temple, and they have not spoken against our goddess. If Demetrius and the other craftsmen have a case against them, the courts are in session, and the officials can judge. Let them make formal charges. And if there are complaints about other matters, they can be settled in a legal assembly. 
I'm afraid we are in danger of being charged with rioting by the Roman government, since there is no reason for all this commotion. And if Rome demands an explanation, we won't know what to say. Then he dismissed them, and the crowd slowly dispersed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, friends, good morning and uh, welcome to church this morning. We're continuing our series in the book of Acts. And today we are looking at um, the issue of idols, of you know, man-made gods, and what they look like, what you know, influence they have over people. And we're looking at uh, a particular situation in Ephesus 2,000 years ago, but these things certainly relate to us now. So how about we begin by praying? Father, we thank you that you are the Lord Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, full of wisdom and goodness. And we thank you that you have made us in your wisdom and goodness to know you, to be your children, your nation, your your people. Father, please teach us this morning about uh, idols, about man-made gods. Uh, please help us to see them in our lives. Help us to turn away from them um, because they take us away from you and they stop us from experiencing you in all your goodness. Lord, we pray for your special work in us this morning by your spirit and your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, in our world today, slogans are everywhere. They capture our attention and sometimes they are unforgettable. You know, when you hear a slogan, you can almost see the product. And sometimes when you see the product, you can hear the slogan. And so what I wanted to do this morning was to begin by giving you a little test. So there are six slogans that I would like to read out to you. And I want you to see if you can, you know, guess or remember which companies belong which, which, which slogans. So are you ready? Number one, just do it. Well, that's easy, isn't it? That's Nike. Number two, how about this one? Finish the words in this slogan. Have a break. Have a Kit Kat. Number three, don't leave home without it. That's American Express. Number four, eat fresh. That's the slogan for Subway. Number five, the best a man can get. That's Gillette Razors. And finally, it keeps going and going and going. That's the Energizer batteries. Now, did anyone get six out of six? Well, if that's you, then well done. Although you may want to consider not watching so much advertising. Now, friends, great slogans have a few very important things in common. One of them is that just like, you know, mobile telephone numbers, which have 10 digits, all good slogans have less than 10 words. And this makes them very easy to remember. And good slogans also summarize a very big idea into a very small, catchy phrase that tells you what is the most important thing about that company or that product. But friends, it's not just businesses that have slogans. Because believe it or not, even churches have slogans. It's true. Even churches have slogans. And in case you didn't know, even our little church right here in Campsie has a slogan. And so for double points and an extra large muffin during morning tea, do you know what our church slogan is? Well, I know that people like Elsie and David Kay will definitely be enjoying an extra large muffin during morning tea today because they know that our church slogan is this. Our slogan is a church for all nations. And pretty much that describes our little church very well, doesn't it? You know, it's a church that's full of people from 
all over the world. Everyone is welcome to come. And in a few weeks, once, you know, this lockdown 2.0 begins to ease, that is something that we will enjoy together again. A church full of many nations. But friends, did you also know that 2,000 years ago, when the Apostle Paul was in Ephesus teaching the people there about the risen Jesus, the Apostle Paul also had a slogan. He actually had a slogan. You know, as Paul lived in emphasis for those two years and he taught the people about the risen Jesus, you know, in the streets and the hall of Tyrannus, as we saw last week, and from house to house, as Paul did all of that, he had a slogan. He had a big message that was cut right down into a slogan that almost everyone in that city new. And the slogan that Paul was famous for in the uh, city of Ephesus may really surprise you because his slogan wasn't, Jesus loves you. His slogan wasn't, Christians aren't perfect, they're just forgiven. His slogan wasn't even that Jesus died for your sins. That, That wasn't his slogan. That's not what he was known for. In fact, the slogan in Ephesus 2,000 years ago that Paul was known for is something we may never even think about today. And that is shocking. Instead, as the people of Ephesus heard Paul teach about the risen Jesus, as the people heard Paul invite them to live a new life with the risen Jesus, What stood out for them, what shocked them, what grabbed their attention was this strange slogan, an unforgettable slogan, an unforgettable nine words. Now, I know that you really, really want to know what his slogan was. So look at these words. See if you can work out what Paul's slogan was from this description in Acts chapter 19. We read this. About that time, there was a major disturbance in the city of Ephesus concerning the way. It began with Demetrius, a silversmith who had a large business manufacturing silver shrines of the great goddess Artemis. He employed many craftsmen and he called them together, along with others employed in similar trades, and he pleaded with them. Gentlemen, you know that our wealth comes from our business. But as you have seen and heard, this man Paul has been telling people that gods made with human hands aren't gods at all. Now, friends, did you notice the slogan in those verses that Paul, uh, that, sorry, Demetrius spoke? It was a very short slogan, very catchy. And Demetrius said it so well, so clearly. Did you see Paul's slogan? There it was right at the end. Look at this. Demetrius says this, God's made with human hands aren't God's at all. Friends, that was Paul's slogan when he was working in the city of Ephesus as a missionary. This is what he was known for. These words, these nine little words. God's made with human hands aren't God's at all. It's very short, very catchy. No one is going to forget that. And it's very challenging. In that city, in that time, this slogan was very, very challenging. Because this slogan challenged the way that those people lived. Because they indeed did worship man-made gods. That's how they lived. And this slogan, these nine short words, challenged their lives. Now, the funny thing is that Paul probably didn't come up with this slogan. 
You know, Paul didn't sit down with some advertising gurus and try and come up with a slogan that he could put over T-shirts and, you know, on a red cap Trump style to try and advertise the good news of the risen Jesus. That's not what Paul did. Instead, Paul preached. He taught about the risen Jesus, you know, calmly and clearly to whoever would listen to him. And he invited everyone, anyone, to come and live a new life with the risen Jesus in their lives every day. That's what he did. But as the people heard him speak, What they heard, what they focused on, what really shocked them about this new way of life that Christians call the way, what really grabbed their attention and they couldn't stop thinking about was that truth. That statement, that slogan, that statement that became a slogan, God's made with human hands aren't God's at all. In other words, man-made gods aren't gods. Man-made gods aren't good. And man-made gods can't give you life. That's what these people heard. That was the power of this slogan that everyone in that city knew. And so, of course, if you're a businessman who's making money from selling man-made gods to people, you know, so they can take home and put in a corner somewhere and light candles and pray to, or maybe put around their neck like a necklace, or maybe they can put the, the little god on the dash of their car to, you know, sort of give them good luck. If that's your business, if that's how you make your money, if that's how you live, well, this message, this slogan, ain't going to make you very happy, is it? Because as more and more people hear this message and believe this message, less and less people are going to come into your shop and buy their little God. And that's exactly what was happening in the city of Ephesus. More and more people were turning to Jesus and more and more people were turning away from their idols, away from their statues, away from their old way of life and their idols, they were just throwing them in the bin. And that made some people like Demetrius very, very angry. Look at what happens here. This is what Demetrius says. Paul has been telling people that gods made with human hands aren't gods at all. Not only is this damaging our business, but I'm concerned that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will lose its influence and that the magnificent goddess who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and all around the world will be robbed of her great honour. Friends, here we clearly see the power of idols in the ancient world, the power of man-made gods. Because the worship of idols back then wasn't a small thing. You know, it wasn't something you did just in the privacy of your own home, something that people keep telling us Christians that we should do today. Oh, you know, just worship God in the privacy of your own home. But back then, it wasn't like that. No way. Worshipping man-made gods not only affected your private life, it affected everything. It affected business, commerce, the society. It shaped the the things that people honoured and cherished and loved. You know, the the worship of man-made idols was everywhere in Ephesus. And so when Paul walks into town and says... Well, you know, guys, those gods you're worshipping, they're not really gods. You're wasting your money. You're wasting your time. Because those man-made gods have no power to improve your life at all. Well, if that's part of the message that you have, if that's part of the message of the lordship of the risen Jesus, then that's going to make a lot of people very, very angry. 
And it's going to make them very, very angry very quickly when you challenge their life. And friends, if you want to see just how quickly a mob can form and how dangerous and random a mob can be, we'll just look at these words. This mob in Ephesus. I mean, a classic example of what a mob does, how it forms, how it destroys. Listen to these words. So Demetrius speaks and we read that that set them off on a frenzy. They ran into the streets yelling, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! They put the whole city in an uproar and they stampeded into the stadium, grabbing two of Paul's co-workers on the way, Gaius and Aristarchus. Inside the amphitheatre, the people were all shouting, some one thing, some another, everything was in confusion. In fact, most of them didn't even know why they were there. Now, friends, there you have it. Total chaos. Confusion. No one knows what they're doing. And there's even a bit of, you know, uh, mob violence thrown in there. You know, if you can't find Paul, hey, that doesn't matter. Just grab two of, two of his friends. Drag them into the crowd. Shout and scream and yell. Don't think, just scream, make noise, lose control, because what we love is in danger, because our lives are in danger, and what we love is being challenged by this Jesus. And friends, that's what happens. It happened then. It happens today. Whenever anyone's life is challenged by the risen Jesus, whenever any of their idols, any of the things they cherish and love and live for, when the risen Jesus challenges those things, that that life, there will always be trouble. There will always be fear. Anger, aggression, and sometimes even violence. That's what happens. It happened back then. It happens today. That is the power of idols in people's lives. And when the risen Jesus comes and stands there and says, I am God, you are not, that is not, live for me. Don't expect peace and harmony. Expect mobs. Expect anger, aggression, resentment, even violence. Because that is the hold that idols have on people, even today. Now, friends, I know for the past 18 months during covid During these lockdowns, we have all had to listen to public servants a lot, haven't we? You know, we've had to listen almost every single day. We've had to listen to public servants tell us what we can do, what we can't do, and when we can't do it. And so I'm guessing that by now you probably don't want to listen to any more public servants tell anyone what to do. But friends, the public servant here in the city of Ephesus, the town clerk, I think he's a bit different. You see, as the town clerk, you know, stands up in the amphitheater, which is just covered in noise and people, as he is able to speak, this guy is a great public servant. And he does a very good job in calming the crowd. And I say this because he calmly, logically tells the people what's going on. And then he warns them appropriately and then he lets them choose to do what is the right thing to do. In this case, the right thing to do back then is just to go home. Now, friends, listen to the way this public servant speaks to the people. Verse 35. After the crowd shouted, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians for about two hours. 
The town clerk, a public servant, was finally able to speak. He said, citizens of Ephesus, everyone knows that Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis, whose image fell down to us from heaven. Since everyone knows this fact, you should stay calm and not do anything rash. Now, wouldn't it be amazing if our leaders spoke like that? He said, you have brought these men here, but they have stolen nothing from the temple and they have not spoken against our goddess. If Demetrius and the other craftsmen have a case against them, the courts are in session and the officials can judge. Let them make formal charges. And if there are complaints about other matters, they can be settled in a legal assembly. And this guy's great. I'm afraid we're in danger of being charged with rioting by the Roman government, since there is no reason for all this commotion. And if Rome demands an explanation, we won't know what to say. Then he dismissed them, and the crowd slowly dispersed. You see, friends, I think this is the right way for leaders to use their power and authority. Explain things clearly. You know, explain things calmly as they really are. You know, warn people appropriately, of course, but be calm. Explain things clearly and calmly and let people decide what is the best thing to do. And at the end of the town clerk's, you know, incredible speech, which, you know, we could really do with a town clerk like that. At the end of the speech, the people realise, well, really, you know, the Christians haven't done anything wrong. We might as well go home. We're wasting our time. We don't even know why we're here. And it's true, friends, these Christians, Paul, they've done nothing wrong, nothing illegal. I mean, they haven't pulled down statues. They haven't graffitied on walls. They haven't damaged private property. They haven't plastered walls with disgusting posters. They haven't done that. That happens today. Other people do that. Not God's people. We'd never do things like that. Is it Paul and God's people? What they do is speak the truth calmly. We speak it clearly. We talk about God clearly and calmly. We talk about life clearly, logically and calmly. And we invite people to leave their old lives behind and to begin a new life with Jesus. We grow in that life with Jesus the way and we calmly invite others to join us. That is how the people of God have always lived. We live, as we learned last week, for the name of Jesus. We live for his reputation, for his glory, for his honour. That's how we live. And as we live that way, we calmly introduce the risen Jesus to anyone who will hear. That is the way of Jesus Christ. And friends, when we're talking about people leaving their idols, we're not just talking about statues here or incense or, or things like that. I mean, idols are a lot bigger problem than just statues. You know, idols aren't just physical things that you can hold with your hands. Because idols are things that live in your heart. And people today have idols. They have things that live in their hearts and rule over their hearts and determine their actions and their life. You see, an idol is anything that lives in your heart and rules over your heart. An idol is anything that you think will give you a better life. 
An idol is anything that you give your time to and your energy to and your money to in the hope that it will give you a better life. That is what an idol is. Now, that could be a statue of Buddha or Mary or maybe a saint, but it could be something like money, education, or even family. You see, an idol is anything, even something good, that takes the place of God in your heart. That is what an idol is. And really, friends, if modern Christians have one blind spot today, you know, if modern Christians have one area of life that we can't see very clearly, that we don't see in ourselves very clearly, this is it. Idols, man-made gods. We modern Christians are really, really bad at seeing the idols that we have in our lives. Not statues necessarily. It could be statues, but it probably won't be. It'll probably be something else, something good. But Christians aren't very good at seeing the idols in our own lives. And this is because our hearts are divided. We say we love God, but we love other things too much. We love other things that aren't God's. We give them our time, our energy, our money, our our hopes, our expectations. We think that they, those things, will give us a better life. That's what many, many Christians do. They are divided in their hearts. And we hold on to these things way too tightly, even good things. We hold on to them so tightly that we can't hold on to Jesus as tightly as we should. And when we do that, We cannot receive the good things that only come from Jesus. Love, joy, peace, goodness, patience, kindness, gentleness. These are the things that come from Jesus, not from idols. Not from other things we love too much. And friends, really, I think the Word of God teaches us you know, these two things about idols. We see some of this in uh, Ephesus, but the Bible teaches two things about idols. One is that idols are things that are not God. You know, they're things that people hope in, invest in, give them time and energy and money, hoping and expecting that these things will somehow satisfy them. And give them life. But they can't. Only Jesus can give eternal life. Only Jesus can give that life to the full that he talked about. But that is what some people do. And the second problem that many modern Christians have is that we love good things too much. And that is a great danger for us. We love the good things that God gives into our hands. We love them too much. We love them way too much. We give them way too much time, too much attention, too much money, too much of ourselves. And we turn good things into idols. Not lifeless physical statues that we bow down to maybe once or twice a week. But we turn good things into idols that live in our hearts, that direct our actions, that fill our minds and focus us in the wrong areas. And friends, that is much more dangerous than a statue will ever be. And this is why, friends, we need this slogan. This 2,000-year-old slogan that we we never think about. 
We need that slogan on our T-shirts, on our caps. We need Paul's slogan today. Gods made with human hands aren't gods at all. That is what we need on our T-shirts today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you very much for this chapter. And we thank you for the honesty of people like Demetrius who must have listened to Paul and understood the implications of the gospel that he preached. That gods made by human hands are not gods at all. They have no power. Father, thank you that the Lord Jesus is a ruler over all and that he has unlimited power to do good, to do good in the world and to do good in our lives. And thank you for his gentleness in inviting us to turn away from all those idols, all the bad things that we love and the good things that we love too much. Lord, please help us to come and humbly make you number one and so that we can deal with all these things, even the good things, in the right way, in the right order for our good. And we ask all of this for the glory of your son, Jesus. Amen. So friends, we have one discussion uh, question there that you can see on the screen. And we're going to try and write a slogan for yourself. Okay, now in this slogan, try and remember to challenge, number one, the wrong things that you love. Number two, the good things that you love too much. Okay, so your task, our task, is to, in less than 10 words, try and write a slogan which challenges us to live for God. And if you can remember the wrong things that we love and the good things that we love too much, it'd be really good if after you've finished yours, if you could post it on, on WhatsApp so others can see. And maybe, just maybe, we'll get a couple of great slogans that will really help us in our life with Jesus today. Okay, enjoy your discussion and then we'll come back and pray.
Hi everyone, my name is Anita. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for today's Bible talk, even though it was challenging and made us feel uncomfortable. It was true and what we needed to hear. Lord, we're sorry that we're just like the people of Ephesus. We have made our own fake little gods and we love them more than we love you. Please show us exactly what our idols are, what has taken your place as number one in our lives and help us change our priorities to always put you first and love you most more than anything or anyone else. Lord, please change us so that following you is not what we do when it's convenient or we feel like it, but it is who we are every moment of every day. May we totally be devoted to you. Help us to be like Paul and his friends who spoke the truth about you, no matter how scary or unpopular it is or what the consequences are. We thank you especially for our missionaries doing just that and preparing to do that all over the world. We also pray for our Christian brothers and sisters everywhere who are speaking and living the truth of Jesus, even when it could cost them their jobs, security, and even their lives. When we watch the news, it seems like evil, injustice and danger are increasing every day as people's hearts harden against you. Lord, things seem to be becoming more out of control and uncertain as COVID consumes the world. Life as we knew it has totally changed. Nothing is certain or stable. At this time, we especially pray for our state government with our Premier just resigning. Thank you for all the work Gladys Berejiklian has done in leading us through these tough times of COVID. We ask that you will give the New South Wales government great wisdom in choosing a new leader for our state. And please help that person to lead with integrity, honesty, wisdom and compassion. We pray for our state and country as it opens up again. We pray the plans will proceed smoothly and we will, and we will recover from the social, emotional and economic effects of COVID. Please give our ministers and wardens wisdom in deciding the best time to begin meeting in person again. Thank you that no matter what is happening around us, that you are in control of everything and you are good, dependable and unchangeable. You are our all-powerful rock who shelters us and keeps us safe forever. Please help us to remember that this life with all its pain and hard times that we go through are temporary and so short compared to the everlasting life that you offer everyone who wants life with you. Help us to remember that although there is lots of bad stuff in this world, there's also so many good things that you give us every day. Things that before COVID hit, we took for granted. We pray that we will be more aware of and thankful for all the wonderful things that you give us each day, like breathing the fresh air you give us without having to wear a mask or the freedom to meet together to worship you without social distancing or any of the other rules or being able to have morning tea, church lunches, go on church camps and even just spend time together without travel or other restrictions. It is true that you don't appreciate something until you lose it. Help us to be grateful for all the wonderful blessings you give us every day. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. There's a Lord of my 
as we finish today we're going to bless one another uh, with the words that you can see there on the screen so how about we say these words to the people who are around you this morning together the lord bless you and protect you 
The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look straight at you and give you peace. Amen. Enjoy your morning tea.